The Honorable, the Judges of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Oyez, oyez, oyez. All persons having any manner or form of business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, are admonished to give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Well, good afternoon to everyone. We have a couple cases for argument today. Your panel today is Judge Thacker and Judge Quattlebaum and myself. We're sitting virtually, but I assure you this is the real Court of Appeals. So with that, we will proceed. I ask all of the counsel to be mindful of the times that you've allotted for yourselves. Otherwise, I may have to just prod you a bit as we approach those time periods. And we will proceed in the usual manner. So let's begin by hearing the first case, which is the Halper case. And we'll hear from Attorney Biss. Judge Wynn, thank you, sir. May it please the Court. My name is Stephen Biss, and I represent Svetlana Lokova in this case. The Supreme Court of the United States, in a unbroken line of cases spanning as long as this country has been around, established the proposition that there ought to be a natural balance between a person's uninterrupted right to an unimpaired reputation and freedom of the press. That's a natural tension that exists in this case. This case demonstrates that something is out of whack. It should never be a case where a political operative and the press should be able to collude to impair the reputation of a private citizen. So, Mr. Biss, let's go directly to the issues here. And unlike the jury argument or talking to the press, you've got some limited time here. And I think it's very important to get directly to the issues. So why don't you start with the first issue and proceed in the manner that you would like. Yes, sir. So we're before the Court on a de novo review of a motion to dismiss under Rule 12b-6. The District Court erred for a number of reasons that are set forth in the brief. And I do have limited time. I'd like to focus on the Court initially, like to focus on the tortious interference with contract. We allege in this complaint, and the brief's documented, page 7, page 42 of the brief, we allege specifically in our amended complaint that Stephon Helper was the source of the defamation. The defamation that ultimately led to the termination of my client's book deal. I think, excuse me, this is Judge Thacker. I think you need to back up and identify, at least for me, what the defamation is. Sure. Judge, the defamation includes allegations that my client had an affair with General Michael Flynn. That's a defamatory statement. Where in the record does it say that your client, by name, had an affair or any sort of sexual relationship with anybody? Well, Judge, it's specifically stated in the complaint. Mr. Helper alleged that to a reporter with the Sunday Times in London. Is that the unnamed reporter? Judge, it is a reporter at the Sunday Times. I don't know if the, I don't have the amended complaint up in front of me to answer your question specifically, but I do know that. On a motion to dismiss, you don't have the amended complaint in front of you? Judge, I'll pull up the amended complaint right now. I'll find it. You go ahead. So the amended complaint specifically alleges, Your Honor, in two important respects, that Mr. Helper was the source of the extramarital affair comment. We allege specifically that he made those comments to a Sunday Times reporter, and we specifically allege that he repeated those comments to colleagues of Ms. Lokova's at Cambridge University. Those are specifically alleged in the amended complaint, and if the court gives me one moment, I will find a specific reference in the record to those allegations. So in paragraph four of the amended complaint, we allege that Mr. Helper made the false statement that the plaintiff had an affair with General Flynn on the orders of Russian intelligence. In paragraph 10, that allegation is again repeated. The 
uh, declaration of falsity is in paragraph 26 of the amended complaint. In paragraph 102, Your Honor, uh, Ms. Ms. Lokova specifically alleges that Halper told the Wall Street Journal that Lokova and Flynn had an affair. And I would submit to Your Honor that um, the, um, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the, the identity of the Wall Street Journal um, reporter is also identified in the complaint. Uh, in paragraph 104, um, again, the, the, um, uh, the allegation of an affair is, is uh, there. Um, paragraph 105. Um, and so there are multiple places in which the, um, in which the uh, allegations of this affair are uh, alleged. There are specific allegations also that um, Mr. Halper falsely accused my client of being a Russian spy or of being associated with the Kremlin. Uh, and the allegation is very clear that my client, uh, a Russian, tried to compromise uh, General Michael Flynn at a February 28 meeting at Cambridge. Uh, and these allegations uh, we submit to your honor are uh, extremely defamatory. We submit that uh, the allegations were uh, made intentionally uh, as part of a uh, campaign to destroy the reputation of uh, General Flynn and Ms. Lokova. Uh, and, I, and I would also submit that there, there, when we talk about Russian collusion in the context of this amended complaint, there can be no allegation that uh, the, the or no suggestion that the allegation of uh, Russian involvement is about my client. Uh, no, no, uh, no question whatsoever. Um, Ms. Uh, Lokova alleges clearly that so, uh, Helper was the source. The district court, I submit respectfully, erred uh, in rejecting that. That's a factual allegation. That allegation ought to have been accepted as true. We ought to have been allowed to go forward with the tortious interference claim and prove uh, the, the allegation. Because as we now know, four years after the fact, four years after the publication of the articles at issue, we now know from declassified material that Mr. Helper, in fact, was the source. We were right all along, but the district court ought to have, as, as a as a matter of, of Twombly and Iqbal, as a matter of the initial gatekeeping function, the district court ought to have accepted these allegations as true. The district court ought to have given us every benefit of the doubt, and I don't think there's really any dispute about the standard of review. Rather, it, 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 this case highlights- When you're importance. talking about the articles of, at issue, you're talking about the, the New York Times articles and, and others that indicated some concern uh, uh, with Mr. Flynn and a, and a Russian at dinner. Is that it? Judge, we're talking about a, uh, actually with, with regard to Stefan Halper, we're talking about a series of publications that begin with a financial times article that's cited in the amended complaint and in the briefing. Then we go to the article that was published by, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Andrew, uh, and that article was published in February. Then we go to the Wall Street Journal article, then a series of articles that were all published that then uh, promoted this false narrative. The whole narrative- So, give, so me, give, me the, give me those dates that you are saying in which these things were published? Yes, sir. There, there is the, th this false narrative judge that, that there no, was- No, no, give, just give me, give me the dates of the yes, matters you just mentioned. The, the, the Financial Times article was in December of 2016. The Andrew that was before May. That was before May 23, 2018. Yes, sir. It, it, okay. it, it was. Go ahead. That was. Um, and and with regard to the to the uh, tortious interference claim, Judge, it's a five-year statute of limitations. So I begin with the December 2016 article. Uh, we go, then go to the February 2017 article by Mr. Uh, Andrew that falsely alleged that that there was email communication between my client and General Flynn, in which General Flynn uh, uh, referenced, referenced himself as General Misha. Then we go to the articles in March by the non-media defendants in this case, The Guardian, uh, The Sunday Times, and, and others. Then we go to the what, Wall what Street- are the, What are the relationships that you maintain were intentionally interfered with, interfered with? What are the specific relationships? Sure, sure you are. There, there is a- there was a second business, uh, book deal with Norton and Collins that was uh, canceled as a result of the allegations that my client had compromised General Flynn or had done something inappropriate at this uh, dinner. Uh, those, and you uh, allege that Halper knew about this? 
Yes, sir, we do. We allege that specifically. Uh, it's in paragraph six. And, and in our brief, it's discussed in pages 50 and 51 of the brief uh, and on pages 16 and 17 of our response brief. We just hey, could you please in, counsel counsel this judge Qualabom, if you could I, I'm, I'm more worried about your complaint than the brief. So yes, I, I want to make sure I get the um, place where you're saying that Mr. Halper knew of that relationship. I think you said paragraph six. Yes, sir. Paragraph six and paragraph 197. Uh, okay. We specifically allege, uh, and, and this is, I'll, I'll, I'll give your honor the site to the, the amended complaint, or if your honor would like, I'll give you the site to the, to the joint appendix. Uh, whichever is no, I, I, I'm, I have it. I'm, yes, sir. Just the paragraphs are fine. So in the amended complaint, we allege specifically how and why Helper knew. This is pa paragraphs 58, 76, and 198, um, and we specifically allege in paragraphs 6 and 197 what the contracts and business expectancies were, including the well, book deal. Yes, sir. I, I, I'm looking at paragraph 197, and, and it says that you know, your client had expectations of book deals and employment. And then 198, it said the defendants had knowledge of her contracts and business expectancies. It, do, do you have something with any more factual specificity to be, I mean, that, I'm not trying to make a decision here, but some might say that's somewhat conclusory. Do you have something that actually are facts that, you know, if, if true, would show that he actually knew about them? Uh, we, we, we do, Your Honor. In the, um, in, the, um, in the opening brief that we filed, we, we specifically, this is on, beginning on page 51 of the brief, but, but the amended complaint paragraph. No, 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 40, no. It, it, won't, it won't work to have it in your brief, what Judge Quattlebaum is mentioning. Where is it in the complaint? Yes, sir. It, yes, sir. It's uh, uh, paragraphs. Um, 43, 56, 76, and 198. And what we allege in these paragraphs is that Mr. Helper was the convener of these intelligence seminars until July 2016. He was aware of Ms. Lokova's participation in the seminars. He was aware of her participation in something called the Cambridge Security Initiative. In September of 2015, he was involved in approving her appointment to, the, to, to a, a fellowship. And as a result of his position, at Cambridge and his interactions with Mr. Dearlove and Mr. Andrew, he was aware of her book deals and business expectancy. That's in, in paragraph 43, 56, 76, and 198 of the amended complaint. And again, I just was directing your honor's attention. Could you repeat to those one more time? One more yes, time, sir. please, sir. Sure. It's uh, paragraphs 43, 56, 76, and 198. Read together, Your Honor, uh, all allege that uh, they're the, the basis for which we believe Mr. Helper, uh, especially his interactions with Dear Love and Andrew, uh, well, he was aware of Ms. Uh, Lokova's book deal. We allege that he was aware, and I think with that allegation, with those allegations viewed in a light most favorable to this plaintiff, uh, coupled with the other allegations in the complaint that he was the source of these false allegations, she was well, you, you brought she up had. the Iqbal and the Twomley cases, and what Judge Qualibon was getting to, I, I'm sort of there too. Uh, they are, you do state it, but it is a conclusion that you're stating, and what we're looking for are the specific facts that would support the conclusion, other than you say it. Well, Judge, I, I think that, that we've described what Mr. Halper's role was, what his interaction was with his uh, colleagues, what his knowledge of Ms. Lokova's uh, status at Cambridge was. Uh, and, and we allege very, very specifically here that with, with, couple, with, with all of those facts put together, especially his interaction with Mr. Andrew, who was aware of all these book deals, Mr. Halper was aware of her book deal. Uh, uh, based on all those facts, and I would submit to your honor that um, the the 
when the allegations, when the inferences are resolved uh, in, in plaintiff's favor and all the allegations are accepted as true, there is enough to show that he had knowledge, he was aware that she had these book deals and that uh, the action that he took was uh, intentionally interfered with those book deals, um, uh, causing her to, to, uh, to uh, lose the book deal. Um, the, the, the other thing that I would commend to your honors is uh, Mr. Helper was the, the one who was uh, uh, peculiarly, uh, this, this issue of awareness is peculiarly within Mr. Helper's knowledge and, and understanding. This is not something that, um, that can be proven with, with anything other than some discovery in the case, but we certainly allege that he was aware. And based on the cases that we cite, uh, cases from the Fourth Circuit, the Eastern District of Virginia, the allegation of, of awareness on these facts is sufficient to get past the quality. So, so Mr. Biss, Mr. Biss, you, you made several arguments and brought up several issues and you chose to argue just this one. Is that an indication you believe this is your strongest argument before us? No, sir. I, 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 uh, I, I filed a, a very lengthy brief. Uh, I understand, but I, I'm we, just going on based on what you chose to focus before this court on this one issue. But now your time is up. If you want to dig into your uh, additional time, you can do so, or you can save it and bring that back up when you come back. Yes, sir. I think that's what I'm going to do. Thank you, Judge. All right. Then we will move to hear from the Council for Appellees here. <laughs> Starting with uh, Mr. Berlin. Good afternoon. May it please the court. I'm Jeff Berlin. I represent the New York Times and Dow Jones, the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, after I speak, you'll hear from Ms. Hammond, who represents NBC Universal and the Washington Post, and then from Mr. Reed, who represents Mr. Halper. Um, let me ask you. Let me ask you before you start, so I understand. Now, this issue on the tortious interference with contracts and business expectancies. Uh, it doesn't seem to apply to the media defendants, but and it seems as though uh, at least must be seen to present it from uh, Halper. So, uh, is that something that affects your clients? Uh, our our best understanding of this case, Your Honor, is that it does not for a couple of reasons. First, uh, that the tortious interference claim uh, was not. We, we argued about this in the trial court and. Mr. Biss did not respond on that to the media defendants at all, number one. When we got to this court, uh, the arguments in the briefs are only addressing Mr. Halper, not any of the other defendants. And we took that to be that that argument was waived. Number three is- That's the way it appears to me. I don't know what my colleagues see or think about it, but it looks to me, and that was the way in which Mr. Biss seemed to have argued it, is focused on Mr. Halper uh, here. And um, so I assume that what you're about to tell us will address, maybe touch upon the other issues that he didn't touch on now, but you proceed as you wish. Well, let me just, let me add one other ground, which is on the tortious interference, and then I'll move on, which is that as, as uh, Mr. Biss, you heard Mr. Biss say just a moment ago uh, that Mr. Halper, in his allegation, was that the knowledge uh, and awareness of these book contracts was peculiarly within the knowledge of uh, Mr. Halper. By extension, that is not peculiarly within the knowledge of any of the other defendants. And as a result, uh, there cannot be a claim for tortious interference. Uh, but again, you know, if you don't brief it and you can't argue about it, it's a little hard to uh, respond. Um, the, the same actually is a little bit true on the statute of limitations issue, which is the grounds that were the, the basis for Judge Brinkman's dismissal of the, the New York Times and Dow Jones, and, for, and, and as you'll hear, I think, from Ms. Hammond some of the publications by uh, Malcolm Nance, uh, who was a commentator for uh, MSNBC. The, uh, let me just address those that relate to uh, the, uh, the Times and the Journal, if I could. Uh, uh, Mr. Burley, if you could if you could speak up just a tad, I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, and I, I apologize, but I, I want to make sure I hear what you say. I apologize. Is that better, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Will do. And, and be specific regarding the issues you're addressing because you apparently all of you are representing different clients and there's different uh, allegations that may fit your particular clients. So be specific there. 
Well, what I'll do here, Your Honor, is to just focus on the Times and the Journal. Let me start with the Journal, since that was the first publication. It was published more than two years before this complaint was filed. It drew a letter of objection from counsel for Ms. Lokova two weeks later, and then she essentially sat on her hands for a couple of years. The Times article that's at issue was published more than a year before the statute of limitations period. And as a result, both of them are on their face, barred by Virginia's one-year statute of limitations. Now, what about the, if counsel, if I could get, the Times has a, the alleged defamatory article in the Times, I grant you, is outside the statute of limitations period. And I think that the grounds for being within the statute are twofold. One, the third-party tweets, and I don't want to talk about that right now. And the other is the republication via a hype, maybe that's not, maybe that's a conclusion, but the use of the hyperlink of that same article in a, in a subsequent article. If you, if you could address that, please. I mean, I'm, you know, I can appreciate your position to third-party tweets and how that, you know, you don't have any control over that. But when you elect to run a second article with a hyperlink that, you know, is in effect the entire article right there, why aren't you exposing yourself at least to be within the statute of limitations when you do that? Sure. So, Your Honor, this case actually presents a good example of why that shouldn't be the case, right? So what we have here is we have an, we have an article. The first article was principally about an alleged surveillance of the Trump campaign. And there's a passing reference in a couple of paragraphs at most to a interaction between Flynn and a Russian woman. She's not actually identified. And then, and later, there's another article also about alleged spying on the Trump campaign. And they refer back to this article, right? It's not a refer, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying referring back. Right. And I'm not saying it's defamatory at all. I don't know that. I'm just talking about statute of limitations. And you're saying referring back. Well, that, maybe that's what you say, but it's a hyperlink that actually places the article within the article. So, I mean, that, that seems different to me than a reference back. For what it's worth, Your Honor, you know, a number of courts, including the Sixth Circuit in Clark and the Third Circuit in In re Philadelphia newspapers have looked at this very issue and have concluded that for good and valid reasons, that a hyperlink by itself, right, a hyperlink by itself is deemed to be a reference, not a republication. And that what transforms that potentially into a republication is if you do state the defamation. So let's say in the second article that's within the statute of limitations, this is not the case, but let's say that the Times had said that, you know, Ms. Lokova had a, an affair with General Flynn or Ms. Lokova was spying for Russia and see this article. And then they hyperlink to the earlier article. Now that would be a restatement and that would be a republication that would be within it. And the reason why we don't otherwise want to do that is we want to encourage people who write journalistic news organizations to be able to refer back to things that have been said either by themselves or by others in the past without fear that doing so, which otherwise expands the understanding of the reader, will expose them to liability. So the reason is that the hyperlink simply goes back to the original article, but you're saying if the headline had been included with the defamatory material, it would probably be very more problematic for you. Well, yes. What I'm saying is if you restate the defamation and then say, here's a hyperlink, right? That is, then you've republished the defamation. But if you say simply, here's a hyperlink, and in this case, it's a hyperlink that is in an article that has nothing to do with Ms. Lokova, that should not be deemed to be a republication because it will provide a disincentive for writers to include hyperlinks, which otherwise help inform readers. Judge Quattlebaum, you had a further inquiry? No, I think you, thank you. You've covered it, Judge Wynn. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Mr. Berlin, your time's up. May I have just 30 seconds to wrap up? You may have, get 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds. I just wanted to say, because there's been some question about some of these other claims, and I don't know what Mr. Biss will say on reply, 
that we would just simply rely on our briefs on the conspiracy claim, which is the one other remaining claim, and on the alternative grounds for affirmance, which would speak to the merits of both the journal article and the Times article. And otherwise, I would re respectfully request that the judgment be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perlin. Uh, Ms. Hanman, you're next up. <laughs> Your Honor, good morning, good afternoon. Um, uh, as we were saying, the tweets and the broadcasts uh, that predate May 23, 2018 are barred by the statute of limitations. Now, whom are you representing here? I'm sorry, I'm representing the Washington Post and NBC Universal. Uh, Mr. Nance, whose tweet, there is one tweet that really is still at issue that was in July of 2018. He had two tweets in July 2018, but on appeal, there's only one that um, uh, the plaintiff appears to be pursuing. And Mr. Nance was named as a defendant in the amended complaint, but never served. And uh, the plaintiff does not disagree that he is not a party at this point. I wasn't in the district court, and he's not been in the appeal. Uh, Mr. Nance is also not an employee of NBC. Plaintiff doesn't allege it, nor could she. She was a freelance contributor. Um, and uh, he t his tweet on uh, July 19, 2018, was from his personal account. Uh, in his personal account, he has a biography, starts with U.S. intelligence, but plus 36 years, has a number of other things, including best-selling author, and at the very end says, NBC... MSNBC doesn't say he's an employee. Just list of all his various biographical details. Um, well, you you really can just get to where you need to go by pointing to Virginia law. We we are controlled here by Virginia law, and the question then becomes: uh, in order to establish a claim of this sort, you, it's a respondent superior uh, uh, mode, and the question is whether there's an employee-employee relationship alleged here, and and this looks clear to me it was alleged in an agency type relationship more akin to an independent contractor uh, from that perspective. So, I mean, it's either, I mean, I, I don't want to make it too too clear cut, but it's either that or not uh, uh, in, in, in from from your perspective. So we, we can talk about the facts of it, but that's essentially what the allegations are, are setting for. <laughs> You're absolutely correct, Your Honor. And as to apparent authority, which is all that, apparent agency, which is all that would be here, Virginia law is pretty clear that uh, there's no vicarious liability for torts uh, such as libel. And uh, the Garnett case, there it was an actual employee. And the court in 2018 said, you know, we don't want employers, uh, they can't prevent what gets said at the proverbial water cooler. Uh, and in the age of COVID, social media is the only water cooler at this point. And but is there, um, counsel, is there any, I mean, I, 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 and maybe the Sanchez case and uh, yeah. Yeah, others block this from a Virginia law standpoint. That, that very well may, may be the case. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think the plaintiffs are suggesting that an employer, you know, should be responsible for every tweet that an employee or an agent might, you know, it, it might might uh, issue. Um, the question is, to me, um, at least subject to the Sanchez case. I mean, are there facts that an employer could do to kind of promote um, uh, promote its agent as an expert to pay its agent to talk about a matter? You know. Yeah, and, 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 and they allege some of this. They allege that, that, that an employee retweeted certain of Mr. Nance's um, tweets. Um, are there things that you could do to take you out of you're just being held responsible where you're engaging in some type of promotion of the social media um, publication? Well, as you know, in the tweet question here, don't mention NBC. Don't promote NBC or any broadcast. Don't link to any broadcast. Don't uh, link to any social media of NBC or MSNBC. In fact, he promotes his own book, and he links to The Guardian. Um, and these are not promotional acts for NBC. Yes, he's an expert, as we said, uh, and, and that's no doubt why he's on TV. 
but he's not doing the business in his personal account here uh, of NBC. And how would NBC patrol it? Uh, they have, you know, dozens and dozens of these experts. Um, so it, 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 as your honor says, it, it, they're not saying he's, uh, that the employer should, but it would be even more far-fetched and under Sanchez, as your honor is saying, even under a parent agency, there wouldn't be liability for torts, uh, vicarious liability for torts. And, and you're speaking of Virginia law here, aren't you? I mean, I, I mean, it, it is helpful to, uh, I think, when we think about these in the general conversation of what respondent superior or agency type law or even independent contractor, uh, Virginia had some pretty specific law here, some of which we've kind of interpreted one one way or the other. Uh, but um, the Sanchez case is pretty controlling. I mean, it's a Supreme Court Virginia case here. Um, but anyway, proceed if you, if you have some yeah, more. And I'll this. just quickly mention that even if there was respondeat superior, the tweet in question is protected speech. Uh, it is about Maria Butina, the Russian spy, and way down on the list, someone says, uh, Flynn and Lakova, and Nance replies, very likely. That's exactly the kind of speculative supposition, uh, surmise, uh, conjecture that this court in the biospherics case said that's opinion. And it's even more so in the context of Twitter where people don't expect, you know, lengthy investigative stories, uh, they expect breezy hyperbole. Uh, the you, only have other that, you have that same 30 second I gave you a co-counsel to oh, wrap this up. That's a problem. <laughs> well, let me quickly say then about the Washington Post. Uh, uh, that article uh, absolutely did not, uh, uh, and this is what Judge Pickema found, uh, in any way say they were disconcerted by anything that the plaintiff, an un, unnamed in the article, anything that the Russian grad student did. They said, it says specifically, disconcerted by Flynn's attention to the Russian grad student. There is absolutely- Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Henman. Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, Mr. Reed, you are the anchor man here on this. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Terrence Reed, on behalf of the appellee and cross appellant, Stephan Halper. Um, this is a $25 million defamation case brought by plaintiff, a former Cambridge student, alleging that- So you, you, you're you going to talk to us directly about what Mr. Biss took up his time to talk about the whole time on tortious interference with contracts and business expectancies, because he was talking about your client. I, w I will get there. And he says he says the allegations in response to questions, myself and Judge Qualabon, that that, that your client knew about this, knew about this book deal. It's alleged right there with specificity in the complaint. How do you respond? Well, like most other allegations in the complaint, it's totally conclusory. There are no facts indicating uh, whether or how uh, Professor Halper would have any knowledge of book deals by the plaintiff. In fact, she said she never spoke to him in her life. Um, so, and even on top of that, uh, as to the tortious interference, there is no interference. The only allegation with respect to interference is the defamation, okay? And with, as the judge, Judge Brinkham, found, when the defamation goes, that goes, uh, it, it takes with it both the conspiracy and the tortious interference claim, because for tortious interference in Virginia, you have to have an improper means. And the, but the but counsel... Means, Definitely. Counsel, if I could um, stop you there, make sure I understand what you're saying. Are you saying, I mean, I think you're right that you have to have an underlying tort. I agree with that. Um, are you saying that um, the tortious interference, aside from the knowledge of your client, fails on the merits or fails on the statute of limitations? It fails on the merits. It fails on the statute of limitations. Both. But, but, but would the, let's just hypothetically if the statute, if, if it was a, an unquestionably defamatory statement that was outside of one year, but w would you get the benefit of that one year statute limitation for defamation if the claim is tortious interference and has a longer statute? Uh, short answer is no. And the, 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 the quickest way to get to that answer 
is to read the, the statute of limitations statute for Virginia, which specifically says any injury arising out of defamation uh, and is, is subject to the one year statute of limitation, any injury. Uh, and this would certainly, they would have to prove an injury to uh, recover for tortious interference with, with opportunities through defamation. But, but there, it's not just the statute of limitations. It's that there's, there's no uh, allegation with respect to knowledge. There's no uh, allegation with respect to interference. But, and, well, it would be just the just statute of limitations if it, if it applies. That would, that would end this. Yes, and you were absolutely. saying the five year the five year statute does not apply. It's the one year because the underlying tort is is defamation. Defamation. That's right, and it's right there in the statute. You don't have to go farther than that. Um, but if I could go ahead, mm -hmm. if I could uh, continue, this is a suit claiming uh, that uh, Professor Halper was a quote rat fucker end quote who masterminded a global conspiracy involving um, among the FBI the CIA, the Defense Department, eight competing... Are you, are you getting to your sanctions argument? Because you only have 20 seconds. Is that your sanctions argument that you're getting to? Uh, it will hopefully do double duty. But yes. Okay, well, I, I have I a question assuming, about the sanctions. I was, I, I was assuming you, he would get to that. He's reserved three minutes, and I'm thinking that must be what the three minutes is for. But it's up to you. You can use it. Yes. And the three I, minutes is start now if you want to go ahead and do that. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. The, the only point I would make about about this uh, alleged, con you know, far-flung conspiracy is that Judge Brinkema ruled that it is conclusory within the meaning of Twombly, which was a conspiracy case in itself. Um, and that's precisely what this is here. I'm calling it... Uh, it's also arguably defamatory. Yes, uh, as to my client. Uh, but Specifically the, but, named. Yes. But, but it, again, that is an issue for the court with respect to dealing with litigation privileges, which are important and critical. I, I'm not trying to diminish them, but it also suggests that they have to be policed. The conduct has to be policed, and that's the reason for seeking sanction. Uh, so let's, 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 let, let's, let's do it this way. I think I want to make sure we give you full benefit of your time. You do have these three minutes. And so we've discussed the uh, the, 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 the initial uh, appeal, and then there's a sanction. So why don't you go ahead and take, unless you feel like you've now exhausted the sanction, which is fine, but you had three minutes left, and we could use it for rebuttal if you want to, just in general. So would you just prefer to save that and allow for response to come now? I, I would like Mr. to- Mr. Best? I, I would like to, uh, to, to, to save my three minutes. Um, okay. And I would only- simply say that for the statute of limitations arguments, you have to remember Professor Halper was, is an alleged, through conclusory uh, allegations, an alleged source. So whatever he said, even allegedly, all preceded all the, the eight media articles. And if they're untimely, then whatever it is that they're attributing to him, Okay, Mr. Reed, we're coming back to you in with three minutes. Uh, you know, I don't want to break this up too much, but you guys are the ones who had three lawyers here and you split it up because you have different <laughs> clients. And so it makes it somewhat short shrift uh, on it. But uh, it, as as was stated by Mr. Berlin, we have read your briefs. And so keep that in mind, you know, uh, and, and we'll continue to do so. So, Mr. Bliss, you have uh, uh, about five minutes or so uh, for a rebuttal. Would you like to proceed? But please unmute yourself. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I apologize. Uh, Judge Quattlebaum, I'd like to address a couple of points that you made on this issue of, of republication. Uh, and I won't address all the issues that are, that are brief, but uh, there is a republication that occurred by the repetition by the third parties. And I would submit to Your Honor that in this, issue, in, in this instance, Weaver controls. Weaver says that if the defamation is slanderous per se, uh, it is a republication. It is a natural and probable consequence of the original publication. Um, the other point I want to raise is that on this issue of republication, it is a jury issue. It should not be decided on, on a 12B6 motion. Um, the Samita, Aramo, the Enigma case from New York that we cite uh, all stand for the proposition that it, it, is, it, is, a, uh, it is a jury issue. On the hyperlinked uh, question, um, our position very clearly is that 
these hyperlinks are a per se republication. They, when, they, when they include the hyperlink within the article, they intend to republish it. They republish it in a new edition of the newspaper, and, and they republish it to a new audience, which is Twitter or Facebook. That's the whole purpose of republication is to address the situation where a party directs uh, uh, the, the defamation to a new audience. And that's the whole purpose of republication is to address that. Uh, the cases that we cite in the in, in our brief uh, um, establish the proposition that this is a uh, jury issue that ought to be decided. Uh, um, uh, uh, it ought to be de it's an issue that ought to be decided by the jury. Uh, the the Samita case, for instance, is is distinguishable uh, from what happened in this case. In Samita, there was a letter stuck in a file. It was unintentional, and it was transmitted solely within the same organization. And in this case, we have. Um, hyperlinks that are intentionally inserted into an article to, to continually republish the same false narrative over and over and over, May 18, August 18, April 9, and it goes on and on and on uh, for each of the media defendants. They publish and republish uh, um, over and over and over. So I think under either the repetition by third parties or by the hyperlink... Mr. Biss, time. what under your... Under your uh theory of uh, republication, what is the limiting principle? When will the statute of limitations ever end? And doesn't your theory uh, run afoul of the single uh, publication rules aim to avoid uh, an overwhelming multiplicity of lawsuits, A judge particularly in the day of the inter age of the Internet and multiple tweets by even single individuals in a single day? Judge, I, I actually think that our uh, uh, republication rule appropriately addresses it because Judge Quattlebaum used the word control. So these media defendants are in control of the flow of information. They're the ones who make the initial decision to republish this. They're, they're the ones who are in total control of, of what's going on. Well, Therefore, that might, they, counsel, that might apply to the hyperlink, arguably. There's some other issues there. But what you seem to be arguing about the third-party tweets would expose a defendant, it seems like, you know, to think, as long as they are on the internet, they are, you know, essentially subject to the actions that they have no control over. Third parties can get their stuff and tweet it. Seems to me there's a big difference in that type of a situation and the, de the defendant itself republishing it. Judge, it's, it's a question of accountability. It's a question of who's responsible for putting this into the, the stream of commerce. And these media defendants and Mr. Halper put this stuff into the into the stream of commerce, not Ms. Lokova. So they're the ones who should be responsible. The question is accountability. So Once if they... somebody has a Twitter account and they um, consistently put out false, misleading, defamatory information and then at the bottom say retweet and their millions of followers re retweet it is, is that just countless um actionable defamation cases um in your view and it, it seems it, like that it, would be a problem for a lot of people it, it is and, and what it's going to require is it's going to require the media to self-regulate so That's it is so i'm not talking about the media can it uh, just anybody it, it, it does, Judge. They should be. They should be responsible. People who. All people right. Who so teach. anybody who um, um, puts out a defamatory, derogative tweet, false tweet, misinformation, and says retweet it to their millions, perhaps, of, of followers, they're responsible for that. Judge, I, I see that my, my five minutes is up. May I respond to your question? You may. You may indeed. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Judge, yes. The answer is they, they are responsible. Well, we, that's we, good to know. They, they, they should be. They should be the ones self-regulating. They should be the ones uh, 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 avoiding these kinds of hurtful, false, defamatory narratives. They're responsible for what they do and what they did. They should be responsible. We, it would be the same thing as if, if uh, I was to retweet something or you were to retweet mm -hmm. something or anybody was to retweet. We have to be accountable. For our but you didn't sue and, I, and and counsel but you it 
under that theory, you may very well have been able to sue the individual retweeters. I mean, I, I mean that may be, or it, I mean, whether or not it's defamatory is, of course, a question. But from a statute of limitations period, maybe you could sue those direct retweeters, the third parties themselves, but you didn't do that. I mean, so the, the, the th I think that Judge Thacker's question gets to not whether you, you know, theoretically could sue a bunch of people you didn't sue and avoid the statute, but whether you can avoid the statute ba uh, that applies to the original publisher based on conduct of third parties. I, I think Weaver, the Supreme Court of Virginia, made it crystal clear in Weaver uh, that the, the actions of third parties are attributable back to the original defamer. The, the, the Supreme Court used the word third parties, and it said that if it's defamatory per se, then it, it is per se um, um, a republication that's attributable to the original defamer. And Judge, I, I know my time is up. Thank you. Judges, do you have any further questions? Uh, not of Mr. Biss. Not of Mr. Oh, Biss. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Best. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robert. Reed. You have uh, you have a, about three minutes or so. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first, if I could touch briefly upon the last point, uh, the Weaver opinion, even though it's from 1957, actually uh, uh, anticipated this very issue because it said and held that the third-party republication is not a basis for liability if the third party publishes in, uh, independently of the original uh, publication or without authority, unauthorized republication. And there's no allegation here that Mr. Halper controlled even the media companies, much less downstream uh, internet chatter from the media companies responding to media articles. There's absolutely well, no... Well, let me, uh, uh, counsel, let me stop you there. I'm, I'm a little surprised that you're going there. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, uh, you can correct me, but I mean, you're right. I think Weaver does say that if it's both the independent and unauthorized third-party transmission, it would not, you know, it relate back to the original publisher. But where did, where is it that any of the media publishers, you know, uh, 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 expressed any lack of authority or uh, um, to third parties retweeting? I, I mean, I don't think there's any evidence or there's nothing about that, is there? I mean, th they... They don't, I'm not trying to say this is enough, but it, it seems to me you got a pretty hard argument to say third parties are um, retweeting without authorization when you don't do anything to try to stop it. Well, you know what, I, I'm, I don't represent the media company, so I don't, I, I'm not speaking on their behalf. But I will say that for an individual, the idea that you could, uh, someone could write a tweet in response to an article and, and that would trigger internet chatter going on for decades and uh, keeping the statute alive. That is the end of the statute of limitations. And if I could briefly turn to the issue of sanctions. Uh, we asked for sanctions here for three reasons. First, use of uh, uh, offensive ad hominem repeatedly. So are you asking for us to sanction for what Mr. Biss, uh, uh, for what... Uh, was done in the district court or for what has been filed here? Well, you, Your Honor, I, it's it's mostly in the district court. What, what we're asking is that the court send... The but the district court's um, order is without prejudice. That and is she, correct. And, sh, and the district court specifically said if um, this continues in post litigation then perhaps the district court would revisit it so how how can we intervene now you you can remand this back for the for a full record uh, by the district court taking into consideration post judgment activity including in this court um, that's what we would ask for and we'd ask for the same relief with respect to the statutory immunity question the judge uh, Brinkman didn't address that but uh, if this court affirms the dismissal, that was that is a, a predicate under the Virginia immunity statute for an award of fees. And we would ask that the court, if it does dismiss, uh, uh, affirm the dismissal on appeal, we demand that issue back to Judge Brinkema. Judge Brinkema just, uh, there was a lot on her plate, and she said uh, she didn't have, uh, she wasn't going to address that entire issue because of the uh, her dispositions in, uh, on the other 
issue. Um, thank you, Mr. Thank Reed. Thank you, all of the council. Uh, judges, do you have any further questions you'd like to ask uh, this time? All right. If no, that's the you. case, then appreciate argument from all of the council here. Thank you for uh, being with us in this unusual format. You know, we have the unique uh, uh, distinction of uh, being a court that comes down and shake your hands at the end of the argument. So if you would accept this virtual handshake, uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Thank you. We'll proceed to the next case. And I hope we're looking for the council in uh, United States versus Hart. If that's the case. Uh, if you are prepared to uh, move forward at the time, we will start out with uh, you, Mr. Carpenter. Mm -hmm. May I please the court? Uh, we're asking you to follow the Ninth Circuit's decision in the city council. It holds that a prior conviction does not qualify as a 2252 predicate if it covers consent. 17 year old based solely that bright line i don't know if anybody else is having a problem but i we can't um, hear you yeah mr carpenter is cutting in and out as at least from my perspective it, it might help to step forward mr carpenter that's what in the prior case helped i hope that does with you sure we'll give it a shot can you hear me any better now Slightly, I think but, so. uh, if you'll speak up, maybe that uh, that might help. But we got your mic to you. That uh, that's uh, important. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me. Okay, uh, so decision in the Jaycox case. Is this better or is it still the same problem? For me, it sounded like when you stepped back, it got to where I couldn't hear. I don't know about Judge Wynn and Judge Thacker. I'm sorry. No, I can't. I couldn't either. Okay. Well, I apologize for that. Well, uh, it was good right there. Wherever you are right that's now. That's fine right working. there. Okay. You should stay right there. I will stay right okay. here. Uh, so <laughs> we're asking you to follow the Jaycox case and to hold that uh, a prior conviction does not qualify under Section 2252 if it covers consensual sex with a 17 year old based solely on the age of the participant. Uh, that bright line rule is consistent with both the sexual sex and binding precedent, and it avoids the significant problems that arise under the government's reading of the statute. Now, the answer but what about the fact that the statutory definition of minor is 18 under 2256-1, and doesn't that apply to the offense, the current offense of conviction here, 2252A? So, Your Honor, I think the definition in 2256 is a bit of a red herring in this case because our statutory argument is based on the term abusive and what that statutory term means. But don't you have to start with what my, how minor is defined in the statute? So abusive sexual contact of a minor and a minor is defined as under the age of 18. Yes, Your Honor, and we have no quarrel with that definition applying. Our focus is on what counts as abusive. Um, and we think that the reading that the government has proposed would read out the word abusive entirely. Uh, because it would, and this is the point that Judge Easterbrook makes in the Osborne case, which is that if Congress had intended to cover every piece of sexual conduct with someone under the age uh, of 18, then uh, it would have said so rather than using the word abuse. So whatever the word minor means and whatever the word relating to means, they cannot mean something that renders the word abusive entirely meaningless. And and so uh, that is well uh, yeah, yeah, but but mr carpenter just to follow up on that um you know i, I, I it, it seems to me that the the ninth circuit and with all due respect to them you know takes the um supreme court's quintana case way further than that case says i mean that case you know states the rule that you know if if in determining 
in interpreting a statute that doesn't define minor or doesn't define sexual abuse with a minor, as you point out in the consensual situation, the, 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 you know, it means someone under 16. I don't, as Judge Sacker points out, in our statute, we actually have the minor defined. And, and, and yeah, I just didn't see anything, or maybe I missed it. Point me to where in Quintana that rationale is intended to apply to statutes where the minor is defined. Sure. So I don't know that Quintana necessarily is intended to apply, but I think beyond that particular context. But I do think its definition of the word abusive will apply anywhere that the word abusive is used. Uh, that is again, the same thing that this court did in Ron Hell Castaneda, which involved also a definition of abuse in a different context. And so, so you so you read am I am I correct and I, um, that the the determination the the uh, your focus on abusive as I understand it means if you use that focusing on that term that can only apply in a statutory rape con um, test to someone under sixteen and that but. But that would have to come from the Quintana case, right? Or is that just your argument in general? So, I mean, the Quintana case certainly confirms our argument. Our view is that the word or the phrase abusive sexual conduct involving a minor has to be defined either by reference to the generic definition of that term or by the federal count of the question of which of those two applies. Under either one, though, it excludes conduct with people, uh, with the minor who is 16 or over. Get but there. I don't understand why we would be looking at 2243 or any other statute for the definition of minor when this statute defines minor. Well, so I think the it's important. The statute we're dealing with. So it's important to step back with, and look at why 2256 is defining minor as under age 18. That is in the context, this is a specific uh, provision regulating the production of child pornography. And while there is, I think, variation, obviously, among the states on the age of consent with respect to statutory rape provisions, I think it's uniform across the country that 18 is the threshold for that purpose. And so I think that certainly this uh, piece of the provision also uses the term minor, but minor is used many other times throughout the statute where it is defined specifically by 22. The reference, there's no particular reason to think that uh, 2256 was also meaning to define it for this particular provision, which is, again, one of the small number, one time uh, among many that the word minor used. So, so this, this is a very focal point in the case, and that is that definition of minor is there. But when you look at it, what, what the definition of minor here is relevant to the question of whether the Tennessee law is categorically overbroad as to the meaning of the word minor, uh, for, you know, it, it, and but it is relevant for determining the meaning of abusive uh, in in this context. So 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 rather than as as binding precedents dealing with the sexual context to the abusive, based solely on the petition of age, the victim must be at least in your perspective uh, under the age of sixteen. That's right, Your Honors. And so you have to define abusive uh, somehow. And other courts that have done it, I mean, the, the Ninth Circuit did it in Jaycox in this exact same statute. You know, so this, you know, if the court were to adopt the government's reading that 2256 applies here, it's creating a direct circuit split with the Ninth Circuit uh, on this very question. And I, I think the Ninth Circuit got it right. If you look at the analysis in the Ninth Circuit, they cite the exact same standard that this court cited in the Colson case. It defines this relating to language using a thumb related thing. When you put that, that standard by itself is very general. But when you put uh, some more specific So, so I, I, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm not, I don't have a substantive question, but but I, you're, you, I can't hear you again, Mr. Carpenter. I'm, I, I hate that you're having to do that, but we, we just aren't hearing you. 
Okay. Uh, I think as long as you, as long as you kind of lean forward, it might be uncomfortable. We can <laughs> hear you, but when you back up, we cannot hear you. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry about but, that. But let me, let me at least point one, one, maybe we can get agreement that if we're talking about the categorical approach, if I'm understanding your argument correctly, you're saying for minor, it is a categorical match for abuse. It's not. Sorry, you, I, I may have missed that part of that. That question. in terms of when you're looking at it from a categorical approach, that if you use minor, it is a categorical match, but for abuse, it's not a categorical match. And and we're focusing on the meaning of abuse here, because that is the, the basis upon which you get to this enhancement. That's right, Your Honor. I think our point on minor, it would mirror what the Supreme Court said in Estable Quintana, which is that the precise age threshold varies depending on the context. So Quintana did not say that the word minor means under 16 in all contexts and in all scenarios. It said in this specific context where it is a statutory rape offense based solely on the age of the participant, in that scenario, it's 16. But the Supreme Court specifically reserved the question of whether that same age threshold applies in other circumstances the example it gave was a an offense that uh, prohibits sexual conduct not based on age, but instead based on a special But in Catania, there wasn't a definition, an underlying statutory definition of minor like we have here. Correct? That to look to that, the, the, in Catania, they had to look at, at look elsewhere, look in, uh, for dictionary definitions, the there wasn't a statutory definition for the offense conduct like we have here. Your Honor, that is correct. Uh, but the analysis that Quintana did was really focused, and again, I think it's the same for uh, the Ninth Circuit when it looked at this. It's really focused on the question of, is this conduct abusive or not? And so what we think the analysis here under 2252 is that a statute can relate to abusive sexual conduct only if the most innocent conduct involves the core element of abuse, even if there is a mismatch with respect to some of the other elements of the offense. And so I think that the two Ninth Circuit cases they talked about cited in the Sullivan case that preceded it uh, show how that standard works in practice. So in Sullivan, there was a mismatch with respect to these other elements, um, for the mens rea element in particular. But the court said, we are going to in under 2252 and the relating to standard because it, everything, even the most innocent conduct, involves the core element of abuse. But then in Jaycox, that wasn't true. The most innocent conduct in Jaycox was not abusive. And for that reason, the court held that the relating to standard wasn't satisfied. So we think that standard puts a lot more content into uh, this statute. Uh, the, so the first problem I mentioned reading is the text. Again, you again you need to come back to your mic. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so again, the first problem with the government's reading is the textual one that it reads the word abusive entirely out of the statute. Uh, the second problem. Well, we've we've defined abusive sexual conduct involving a minor as the perpetrator's physical or non-physical misuse or maltreatment of a minor for a purpose associated with sexual gratification. Exactly. So, right. so the, go from there. Certainly. The most innocent conduct here simply doesn't satisfy that definition because a 17-year-old is perfectly capable uh, of consenting to sexual activity according to the vast majority of jurisdictions and according to federal uh, statute as well. So no matter what you look to to give content to the word abusive, be it the generic definition or the federal counterpart, the most innocent conduct covered here isn't abusive. The second problem I point to with the government's test is that it's not administrable because it doesn't identify any limiting principles or provide any guidance to district courts or litigants for how to uh, analyze this statute. I would point in particular to page 30 of my friend's brief, where he argues that the some relations being satisfied because, quote, much of the conduct would be considered abusive. But that begs a lot of questions. How much is much? Is it 90%? Is it 
50 percent uh, and how do we figure that out? Do we have to do an analysis of the cases that have been prosecuted to figure out which ones were abusive and which were not? That gets us right into the problems that Johnson uh, relied upon in invalidating the residual clause analysis. Um, it also brings us to the problem in Malawi uh, that the Supreme Court identified, which is that taking to their extreme, the word relating to has no stopping point at all. Um, but we think that if you focus on the most innocent conduct and require that it have the core element of abuse present, uh, then it solves this problem. That reading gives effect to the statutory text, uh, to each piece of it, the relating to piece as well as uh, the word abuse, and it uh, gives the test that the diminishes district courts and litigants uh, who are confronting these issues. Um, the third. So Mr. Mr. Carpenter, I, and and if you, uh, I, I want to, I think you were addressing this, but I just want to make sure I, I hear it. Um, are you saying that in order to satisfy the relate to language, whatever uh, the, the the conduct that relates to it must also be abusive? Is that I think I heard you saying it that way. Is that what you were saying? Yes, yeah, so I think the way that the Ninth Circuit applies this test is that the most innocent conduct has to include the core element of abuse, even if there is a mismatch on the other elements. So, for example, in Sullivan, there was a mismatch with respect to the mens rea element. The mens rea element was overbroad. Under a traditional categorical approach, it would not have qualified. So it brought it in on that basis. Uh, but, yeah, our position is that the core element of abuse has to be present even in the most innocent conduct. And here it's not, because the most innocent conduct here is the consensual activity with the 17-year-old. And it's under either of the definitions, generic or federal, that uh, conduct is not abuse. Um, Your Honor, before my time is up, I would spend just a minute on the supervised release procedural error issue. Uh, I, I think that if the court agrees with us on the statutory minimum, there is no need to get there. Uh, because it would be a de novo resentencing. But if you do reach it, I think a fairly straightforward application of this court's decisions in Ross and Arbaugh and uh, McMiller would dictate a uh, vacature and remand in this case as well. Thank you, Mr. Copper. You have uh, some time reserved in rebuttal, so we'll come back to you. Mr. Thank Enright, you. good um, to see you yeah. again. I'm going to turn my camera off and see if I can find a way to fix any of our uh, technical issues. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mr. Enright, good to see you again. Please, it's your time. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Anthony Enright for the United States. The district court properly found that Mr. Hardin's Tennessee statutory rape conviction is a conviction relating to abusive sexual conduct involving a minor. As Judge Thacker alluded to, this court has already defined that term in, in, in a binding decision in Colson. It's, you look at the minimum define, conduct. Define what term are you referring to? You define, said that term. De define the term relating to abusive sexual conduct involving a minor. Perhaps it's more than one word, but yeah, that's a several terms. Term. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you is, know, I, I'm not so sure it, it, it boils down to simply just defining that entire sentence. Uh, I could see you uh, going to deal with the relating to the abusive uh, conduct or the minor. And what it seems to me, just to cut to the chase here, it seems to me, you know, you have a statute that does define minor, but the problem here is that this particular one deals with abusive conduct relating uh, as to a minor. And so when you're dealing with abusive conduct, if this federal statute says, well, you can consent, you know, once you're 16, then once you're 16, there's no such thing as abusive conduct for those who can consent. And we're talking about a categorical approach here. So, that, so that's the right. conundrum we, we reach here with that. And then when you look at the, uh, maybe I, the Lynch case is what I would call it, Supreme Court decision dealing with the relating to, it sort of cabins that definition somewhat there. I probably would have more, more of a problem with the relating to than I would the abusive aspect, but, but for the Lynch case, which is a Supreme Court case, but, but go there. Uh, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but 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 you gave that broad phrase that that I I don't think we're quite there. But if you think it is, go ahead. <laughs> well, the the court has defined answered I think many of your questions before. 
So in Colson, what it what it said abuse is is physical or non physical misuse or maltreatment of a minor for purpose for purpose associated with sexual gratification. And in Diaz Ibarra, it it, it it took that term from Diaz Ibarra, defining sexual abuse of a minor in the guidelines. What Diaz Ibarra said is we we reject any argument that you need to look for physical or emotional abuse in an individual case. It's enough that there's maltreatment and that it's for the purpose of sexual gratification. That's a broad statement. This court has repeated that a few times. And when you have a state statute that says that is not a proper use of a minor, you cannot use a minor for this sexual purpose, then it's going to fall within that definition. In both the Isabara, or I'm sorry, in both Esquivel Quintana and Rangel Castaneda, the court looked at the term minor in the context of the guidelines and the INA and said, what does minor mean in this context? They said it's undefined. And it's a term that varies depending on the context and looked at dictionaries, looked at what other states do, looked at other provisions in the federal code. This court doesn't need to do that because minor is defined for every purpose in Chapter 110. But, but, but to, get to, misuse, to get to misuse, you need some sort of abuse, right? Your Honor, you do. And it, in this case, the conduct is abusive because it is under a certain age, the age of 18. And th that's what this court did in Colson. The abusive conduct you're talking in about, Colson. When you're talking no. about statutory rape, you're talking about a question of when consent can be given. And if consent you're can be given at 16 under the federal statute as opposed to the Tennessee statute, you, you've got a problem. No, Your is Honor, for two... Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I don't, I don't want to... Please answer Judge Wynn's question. No, no, Certainly. proceed on. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me let me just address the statute. The federal statute is a different statute that uses a different term. 2243 defines um, sexual abuse of a minor, not a, a different term, not abusive sexual conduct involving a minor. And this court has already decided. And that's not it, the it, statute we're we're dealing with here, right? We're dealing with 2252A here. Correct, Your Honor. And 2243 is in a different chapter. It's not the chapter where the term minor is defined to mean persons and under 18. And statutory rape, consent is not a defense to statutory rape, is it? Consent is not ordinarily a defense to statutory rape. And, Your Honor, what I would note is That's in a case That's sort of the point of statutory rape. Absolutely, right? Your Honor. Just, but you do need to... A, what about Jaycox? I mean, Jaycox so, goes... as a, Ninth Circuit's already decided this... Uh, the other way. So it, what would you have us has, do with Jaycox? I would have your honors not follow it because it's inconsistent with this court's binding precedent. Jaycox applies the, the, the elements of 2243 as a guidepost. It's defined abuse as encompassing behavior that's harmful emotionally and physically. Those are two things this court has rejected in Colson and diaz Those are not Those are not doctrines this court can adopt without conflicting with its prior precedent, even if it wants to. And it defines relating to in a very narrow way. It says uh, relating to will resolve issues at the margins. What this court said is that relating to is a term that Congress chose to ensure, this is a quote from Colson, that individuals with a prior conviction bearing some relation to abusive conduct involving a minor receive enhanced minimum and maximum sentences. And Colson But Mr. Helpfully Carpenter brings up the point that uh, relating to, as we've defined it in our precedent, has really no stopping point or limiting principle, and neither perhaps does the government's argument that that might seem to make every statutory rape just per se an enhancement, that, that's a not, big enhancement. Uh, there, there's two parts to that. One is, I think, the idea that relating to is broad. I don't dispute that. That's what Malouli versus Lynch said. Malouli v. Lynch did not say there's anything wrong with a statement being broad. And in fact, Malouli v. Lynch suggested that relating to would mean something like, in the context of the statute it was approaching, relating to would mean any statute that covered the subject, which in that case was drugs. What they held was, because of a unique historical context, because in the INA, in deportation statutes, there had usually been a specific link to a specific prohibit drug prohibited by the federal statute, they would use a narrower interpretation of relating to than its ordinary meaning. If anything, Lynch confirms that relating to's ordinary meaning is broad, and this court held it was broad in, um, in um, Colson. But Mr. Mr. Enright, 
Mr. Enright, it, 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 I mean, Judge Thacker just asked the question if that view of relating to um, would encompass any statutory rate. And no, no. if the answer to that yes, is there any problem with that? The, the, answer, I, the answer is probably yes. And the reason isn't be for any, I don't know, any is may, maybe too broad, but I think certainly when you're talking about a minor defined the way, or statutory rape where minor is defined as a person under 18, because that's specifically what, how minor is defined in the relevant federal statute. But I don't want to suggest there's no limiting principle. This court already rejected the idea in Spence that, for example, a general assault statute would apply. What you need, I, 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 what, I don't think this court needs to go that far, but I would think what you would ordinarily look for is a sexual element and a, an age element that they hear is sexual abuse. So well, if follow it's up sexual on, follow abuse. Follow up on the questions asked. Um, you know, I, the way I'm hearing you is, under your interpretation, even a sexual encounter with consent with all individuals under 18 would qualify. And, and if you do that, that reads abuse out of the statute. I mean, you go back to the Quintana case and the, the court states very specifically, the generic federal definition of sexual abuse of a minor requires that the victim be younger than, than 16. Uh, Honor, and so it, it seems to me that what you just mean is you, you're talking about sexual encounters with all minors. And that's not what we're dealing with here. No, Your Honor. The, so the statute at issue in Esquivel Quintana, the court was specifically looked at the definition of minor. It said, what does minor mean when it's undefined? We need to figure that out. And it figured that out as 16. In this case, the definition of minor is given to us by statute. It's also a different term. Esquivel Quintana was dealing with a different but term. A, but abuse but, can't just mean sex with minors because the statute already covers sex with minors. In the, in the other words, sexual, minor. So it just can't mean that. And, and, the, and the Quintana case indicates to you when you're dealing with abuse, you're dealing with, with 16. So, Your Honor, the Quintana didn't define the term abuse. It, it, it did not hold, and I, 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 I believe my friend might have said something like this. I, I, I don't, neither this court nor the Supreme Court has held that its c conduct is not categorically abusive if the person is between... I, I'm just reading. Let me read it to you. What I'm reading is not the generic federal definition of sexual abuse of a minor requires that the victim be younger than 16. Did I read yes, that out Honor, of context? But, no, but it's a different term. It's a, The term we're looking at is abusive sexual conduct involving a minor, and the term minor is defined by statute in the context of that phrase. So although the phrases are similar, they have different definitions. That's something so that, Congress that, is allowed and, to and do. maybe that's why we're going around is, is is I'm still coming back to the whole proposition that abuse can't just mean sex with minors. It means something no. else. It has to mean something where the where the where the use of the minor is is improper, is misused. In other words, you have to get to it being abusive. You can be a minor, but it has to be abusive. And if you can give consent. That doesn't put it in the statutory rape, as as Judge Stacker nope. pointed out. You that you know consent is not a de defense of statutory rape, but that deals with age. That means if you yeah. are under this age, you can't consent. But if you're over 16, you can. Your and Honor, this, this and since we're dealing with a categorical statute in, in in Tennessee, it goes up to 18. Your Honor, there, this, this court actually addressed something very similar in Colson. The only reason the conduct at issue in Colson is abusive is because of the age of the victim. It, it addresses a, a teenage girl, 17 years, it's in 10 months old, posing in a, in a relatively sultry pose. That's the language from an actual case, exposing her breasts consensually. Um, the, the, only, the reason that conduct is abusive is because of the age of the person and because that person is under the age of 18. This court held that Oh, it's, it's more than age. It's, isn't that more than age? When you're talking about an age-specific statute, it's just what Judge Snagger said. You can't give consent if you are under 16 or you if you meet it within the statute. What you're talking about is a, other factors involved in it in, in that particular case, other than age alone. Well, there's other there's there's factors other than age alone and statutory rape too. You also have to have in this case sexual penetration of the minor. The person has to be several years older. So it, it isn't purely. And Mr. Uh, Enright, age. consent consent is not a defense to the Tennessee statute we're talking about, is it? 
Consent is not a defense to the Tennessee not a statute. It, isn't, it was not a defense to the Virginia statute this court addressed in Colson. Um, the reason it's abusive but is we because want to of the stick age. With the, we want to stick with the Tennessee statute. And that's why it's the 18. That's the big deal here. And what, well, what, is, I, what I understand the question is that consent, you can be 17 years old. That will not be a defense under the Tennessee statute, but under federal law, it, because consent can be given by children over 16, it would be a defense. So, Your Honor, there's. I, I just want to make sure I understand what federal law we're talking about. There is a there is a federal statutory rape law that governs rape on federal enclaves, for example. That's 18 U.S.C. 2243. I'm and only getting it from the Quantana case, and that is the question of the abusiveness, the abusiveness that you seem to want to read out of Quantana, as, as, as though it did not say that, but it but it says it pretty specifically with regard to 16 year olds. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I don't know that I have a lot more to offer, Your Honor, other than that what Quintana says, and I can probably find the quote from it, but it, it, it's looking at the definition of the term minor. It, it starts with a dictionary definition. Sexual abuse, it's quoting the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of Law. It says, sexual abuse includes the engaging in sexual contact with a person who is below a specified age. And then it says, well, the specified age is that of a minor. What does minor mean in this context? Because it's undefined. We have to figure it out. It means someone who's 16. But in the statute before the court today, the term minor is defined by statute. So even if there's other ways to define it or that's not the ordinary meaning, Congress is free to choose a meaning that's not ordinary. In this case, it, it chose a meaning that you know several states adhere to. Not, 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 they don't even have particularly anything in common. Delaware, Virginia, Tennessee, California. All of them apply a statutory age of 18 for statutory rape. So we're not talking about a statute that's an outlier or something that's extraordinarily unusual. I do want to address the point that this statute requires only that it relate to it. That's broad. It can be broader than a, a match with abusive sexual conduct involving a minor. That's significant. This court held as much in Colson. If the court has no further questions about that, or feel free to return to it, I do want to turn to the conditions of supervised release, um, because I think the district court appropriately addressed them. Um, there's basically two categories of supervised release uh, conditions here. Two of them are the ones this court held were particularly exacting or onerous, required a little more scrutiny in McMiller, um, requiring um, a probation officer's approval to um, have internet connected devices or use social networking accounts. And the court addressed those in detail. It went through the standard, acknowledging that it requires they be less restrictive than reasonable, no less, no more restrictive than reasonably necessary. It went over the defense. But, but we also proposal. require that's that's true. But we also require an, an, an individualized explanation of why even, um, conditions in a district court standing order are being imposed to this particular defendant. Where do you find that in this record? Well, what the court, it, the, so the court did not go through every single one that's being challenged and say something and, 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 and right. And it doesn't have to, but it, it said uh, your point is well taken, I think at one point. And it did, but it also, the court also said, I've, you know, considered the statutory factors. I've considered your arguments, and I believe this is appropriate. And he, it, it, of course, said that before the defendant brought up the conditions of supervised release at the hearing. He, he, he initially, the court said more than defense counsel wanted to say. Defense counsel said, oh, I just want to rest on the record. And it was the court that said, well, let's talk about these in more detail. And what he, what he said, and what I think, what I understand him to say even in his, in his, briefs on appeal is, well, the thesis was he's, he, he, he really doesn't pose a danger to strange children today. And the court, the, the court rejected that somewhat cursorily, but appropriately so. It adopted the, the facts in the pre-sentence report showing that not only did he commit statutory rape, commit six assaults in the intervening years, and then uh, download and, and collect child pornography when he saw a picture of a five-year-old girl. No, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, that's, I, I can understand the reasons the court would have imposed these conditions for all the reasons you're about to give, but the, the court didn't actually 
say that anywhere. So, so your argument is because he adopted the pre because the district court adopted the pre-sentence report, and because the district court said it considered just said it considered all the 3553A, 53A factors, that that's enough. The court doesn't have to say what you're about to say. That the facts here um, indicate that you did use the computer. Um, that this you didn't say I don't want a real kid. It's a five-year-old that's actually being abused. So this is why it weren't. The court didn't say that. So shouldn't the court so, be required to at least provide the individualized explanation that you certainly would be able to give? So I'm not I'm not saying that the that 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 is enough in every case, but I think it is in this particular case because this court looks at the record as a whole, and frankly it's fairly obvious why somebody who has this kind of history that includes both hands-on contact with children and the exploitation of children using social media and using um, using internet connected devices requires this extra measure of caution all of these conditions are but, just, but, they but, just require but, the but counsel if I mean I look I, I I think I have a similar view I mean I I don't think it would be difficult for a court to adequately exp explain the basis of those conditions in this case. Um, it, it seems though that you in, uh, are, are you know, taking a pretty narrow view of what we said in McMiller. And, and, and I'm just trying to make sure how I square what you're saying with that case. It almost seems like if the record as a whole is clear that it would be justified then we don't really have to do what McMiller says. And it's not, um, whether you, anyway, yeah, if you could go ahead. I, I, um. Sure, Your Honor. I don't think it's, it's, I don't think, I'm not saying that if the record's clear, they would be justified as enough. I think that's what McMiller rejected. What I'm saying is if the record is clear enough why those conditions imposed and why the court felt that less restrictive conditions wouldn't cut it, which the court did specifically explain, then I don't think the court needs to say more. I would note that this court has, despite what my friend has said, in published opinions, Bulware is one, uh, Lynn is another one, said that an explanation of an offense, or an inadequate explanation can be a harmless error. And here the district court made clear it understood the standard, it understood the arguments, and it didn't find them persuasive. So what you would have is a harmless error because it's clear the court would impose those same conditions if it had to do it over again. And so for that reason, even if your honors disagree with me about the adequacy of the explanation, I'll ask that the court affirm the judgment of the district court, and I'll yield the one second I have left back. <laughs> All right. Mr. Carpenter, I hope you've gotten your technology back up so you can speak to us in your, with your five minutes. Well, we're going to try. Can you hear me okay now? You are much better. Proceed. Okay. So I was told that we had network issues, and so I went to a headset, which will hopefully help. That's um, great. Okay. So the first point I want to respond to is with respect to the Jaycox case. Uh, my friend mentioned uh, his view that the Ninth Circuit is just applying an entirely different standard than what this court adopted in Colson. And so I would urge the court to take a look at the Jaycox case and, and specifically uh, pin site to page 10, um, 1070, uh, I believe it is, uh, and 1071 where it cites the exact same uh, language in uh, about uh, the broadening of it. And that is language that the Ninth Circuit has relied on since the Cenarius case, uh, which predated Colson and was cited in Colson. All of these cases in, uh, cite the Morales case from the Supreme Court, which is where the some relation language comes from. So the Ninth Circuit has applied that standard uh, for 15 years now, including in the Jaycox and Sullivan cases, and held that it uh, you know, excludes offenses like the one here. Uh, the second point I would make, Judge Quattlebaum asked the question of if uh, the government's interpretation would cover every statutory rape offense, would that be a problem? Uh, and I think it would, and, and I would point to Judge Wilkinson uh, in the Ron Hell Castaneda case at page 377, where he says, if we do not have a uniform federal definition, uh, then, quote, conduct that is perfectly legal for some people could subject many others in neighboring states to years upon years in federal prison. That's an enormous problem with the government's interpretation of this statute, is that it creates giant disparities 
uh, depending on geography. And, and how, how do you respond to the government's argument that Quintana was really just about elaborating on the meaning of minor, not about sexual abuse of a minor? Your Honor, I just don't think it can be squared with the way the Supreme Court uh, explains its reasoning in that case. Um, I, I think they're pretty consistent in saying that conduct is, you know, can, uh, can be considered abusive only uh, in this context. If, if it's based on the age of the participants, then 16 is where the line is generically. And in other contexts, it may be 18. Uh, certainly in the context of the creation of child pornography, everyone, every state that I'm aware of, sets the age at 18, which is why the um, Colson statute is, is just materially different than the one here. Because in that case, the harm isn't the conduct. The, the harm is the creation of the image uh, that uh, can be circulated. And so it's just a, a materially different harm than that covered by a private uh, sexual activity. Um, the other point I would make uh, with respect to uh, Judge Thacker's question about consent not being a defense. And I think that is exactly why this statute does not satisfy the Diaz-Ibarra misuse or maltreatment standard that the court has long adopted. Um, and I would point out my, my colleague, I believe he may have misspoken, but um, he suggested that abuse of sexual conduct involving a minor might have a different definition than sexual abuse of a minor, but that would be inconsistent with this court's decision in Colson, which specifically incorporates the Diaz-Ibarra definition in interpreting 2252. So I, I think if you apply a misuse or maltreatment standard, then consensual activity uh, of this nature doesn't qualify as abusive. And I would again point to Judge Wilkinson's uh, analysis in Ron Hell Castaneda, which addresses the generic definition of statutory rape and also the generic definition of sexual abuse of a minor. And uh, Judge Wilkinson says there that it would be discordant to say that in one context, this uh, uh, um, activity is consensual under the generic definition, but to say in a different context that it is, quote, criminally abusive. I, I think that same uh, discordant uh, outcome uh, would occur here if the court splits with the Ninth Circuit uh, and covers this offense under um, 2252. What about his harmless error argument on the um, uh, limited explanation of the conditions of supervised release? Sure. So on that, Your Honor, the standard that this court has applied, I know the council cited a couple of cases from a decade ago in a different context. Um, I would look at the more recent ones, for example, the Ross case, which says that so long as it's, quote, conceivable that the district court might have reached a different outcome had it considered uh, the overlooked arguments that a remand is appropriate. And I would also emphasize here that the central thesis was simply never addressed. He uh, argued that if you look at the category of sex offenders, he is among the least culpable of them because his, you know, the only quote unquote contact offense that occurred was 25 years ago when he was 18 uh, and, and the uh, other folks were 14. And so that is quite different than you see in many of these cases. There has since that time been no contact offenses, nothing in real life, all of this. No convictions. Of, right, well, no, and, right. And um, yeah. so I think that's all I have on that particular question. So if there are no others, I would thank the court and apologize for the, the tech issues. Yes, I would say that in the future, you perhaps should consider using that headphone. You were much clearer in that five minutes. <laughs> so to you, Mr. Sure. Mr. Carpenter, Mr. Enright, you are both excellent lawyers. I think I can speak for the court and say that. We've enjoyed your arguments, and thank you for, for taking the time to be here to present your cases, which you've done very well. Uh, as I said in the previous case, uh, normally you know that this court is the unique court that comes down to shake your hands uh, as a matter of courtesy. We've done that for decades, and in this instance, we will ask that you accept our virtual handshakes, uh, and uh, we, uh, we are thankful that you've been with us. So with that, we will close court and adjourn until tomorrow. Thank you, Your Thank Honor. You. Appreciate it very much. Good to see you, Josh. This honorable court stands adjourned until tomorrow morning. God save the United States and this honorable court.